Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? We are live and back with day two of the Future of E-Commerce Global. Thank you. There's about a thousand of you uh, that have registered to attend this event. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yesterday, we had you tune in and say where you were tuning in from, and it was people all across the globe. We had Canada, we had Brazil, we had Tokyo. It was just quite incredible. So thanks so much for tuning in from wherever you are. And if you want to drop uh, where you are in chat, there should be a box somewhere down below me. You should see uh, kind of this video embedded in the microsite, a little blurb right below that. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you can uh, say hi in chat. I'd love to know where you're watching from and maybe even what you're looking to get out of this event today. So just like yesterday, I've got a little bit of housekeeping and we're going to go right into all of our back-to-back -back sessions uh, for today. And we have got another amazing day packed for you. If you missed day one, no big deal. All the sessions will be available on demand on our YouTube. And I'll send you a link in just a second so you can go subscribe to our YouTube. Make sure you don't miss that. Uh, other than that, um, what to expect for today? We've got a few interviews. We're going to close out with a merchant interview, which uh, if you're doing any sort of fundraising, you're definitely going to want to stick around for that. We've got uh, a lot of bright minds in venture capital, uh, conversational commerce, and a whole lot more planned for you today. Um, one other thing is that if you aren't following along in the show notes, I will post a link to that in chat. So anything that you did miss from yesterday, you will actually just have like the cliff notes and the to do's and the action items so that you can actually go, uh, you know, do work in the business and get moving in the right direction. Before we begin, I do need to thank all of our sponsors. These are the, the companies that make these events uh, possible and literally free for you. Without their support, you would have to pay for this event, which would be you know, such a crime. Um, and and we, we love being able to give these away for free. So I'll, go, I'll run down the list for you really quick. Thank you to Gorgeous, the help desk for e-commerce. We heard from them yesterday. Rewind, uh, just if you don't have this tool installed, you need the security. You want your site to not crash and or get maliciously attacked for all of those things. Rewind, it's a really easy, just like, uh, you know, way to, to breathe and, and make sure that your, um, your store isn't going to crash right before Black Friday, something like that. Recart, we saw great strategies for messenger marketing from Bridgie from Recart yesterday. OmniSend, the one all-in-one uh, tool, ironically doesn't do messenger, but email, SMS, WhatsApp, and push notifications. Recart and OmniSend go really well together for that omni-channel marketing uh, strategy. Veriphone and to checkout, who we heard from yesterday on global payment processing strategy. We also did hear from bridge payments on, on similar global strategies and for more at-risk brands. Row, the financial management platform for e-commerce, a really great platform that kind of combines a whole bunch of different financial tools and uh, has better banking options than probably what you're do using right now. And Peel Insights, uh, if you are a, a growing brand that needs better understanding of your numbers or know, you know that there's, um, there's just kind of insights sitting there waiting for you to uncover and change your strategy, Peel Insights plugs in, you get a few different dashboards straight out of the box, like 100 when I say a few. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're, you're, you're seeing your own store data in a way that Shopify Analytics just can't do. Uh, and it really is quite amazing. Other than that, um, Let's see, we've got an upcoming event for you that I'll just let you know. We are live with our Black Friday event, so you can go register for that. I see we've got Rio from the Philippines and Verica from Belgrade. Where is Belgrade? I, I've heard this before, but I, I don't even know. Uh, that's my bad. I, I should probably know this. Um, here, I'm going to drop all the links in the chat, and I'm going to bring in our first. Uh, I'm, we're doing more of an interview, so I won't, won't say presenter. But uh, maybe a partner in crime, Elise. How's it going? Hey, it's great. How are you doing? Thanks hey, so much doing, for having me. Yeah, doing great. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. Uh, if you can, really quick, uh, tell everybody what you do at WeCommerce and just a little bit on that kind of unique angle that you look at when it comes to e-commerce and e-commerce technology. Yeah, so WeCommerce is um, an operating company for e-com software and services businesses. I lead acquisitions here. So uh, I look at exceptional businesses in the e-com landscape all day, every day, and talk to exceptional founders and hoping that they will join our uh, our journey. Awesome. Yeah. And these are all the technology founders serving into e-commerce. 
So uh, yeah, so so it's uh, it's you're you're like a layer removed in a way uh, when it comes to uh, perhaps you know the having to deal with the ins and outs of the merchant. But I know that you have to, in order to do your job, stay on top of the changing e-commerce landscape and the changing e-commerce technology landscape, which is no easy feat. I have to kind of do both of those things myself, which is why I wanted to have you on and have just kind of a, a nice casual uh, chat about the, the changes in the technology landscape and, and what that means for merchants. So the, the, the first and most important thing for the, those don't, that don't know, like I'd love to just even hear a little bit more about the WeCommerce Fund, because this is kind of innovative, at least when it was started, it was like the first real fund dedicated to e-commerce technology, I'm pretty sure. And I know it comes out of a bigger fund altogether, but um, maybe even just going back to how, how the fund got started and then even all the way to how the fund is changing the technology landscape for merchants today. Yeah, definitely. WeCommerce was started by Andrew Wilkinson and Chris Sparling, and they have been buying and building uh, businesses in the tech landscape for many years now. And um, they were approached by investors in the public markets to really launch WeCommerce as a focused fund in the e-commerce landscape. Um, and yeah. that was actually pretty recent. We're, we're a little over a, a year old, um, which is crazy to say. And we are listed on the, the Canadian Stock Exchange. Wow. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's definitely a different model um, from a lot of these different uh, hold companies or private equity funds that uh, a lot of these software companies are getting approached by. Um, and we believe this uh, has a lot of benefits. I mean, we have the opportunity to tap into the public markets at any time. Um, so not only does that help us fund the businesses that we are acquiring, but it also allows um, us to build a true platform. So that becomes a value add to um, our uh, the businesses we acquire. I mean, they get to um, not only cash out on their business, but they also do have the opportunity to be a part of something bigger and greater, which is sort of the WeCommerce journey. So yeah. we do try to bake that into our our opportunities. Okay, so this is I'm I've got so many ideas here in tangent. So mm -hmm. when you acquire, uh, who who's in the fund? There's a few uh, a few companies we might know in here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So our most recent. Um, team to join is stamped.io, which is a review platform. Yeah. Love them. Yeah. We, we recommend them a lot. Oh, good. I love that. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, it's a great platform uh, and a great team as well. Um, 460, which is a social UGC platform, um, yeah. which is also amazing. Um, great for uh, increasing your conversions on your site. Uh, Pixel Union, which is where we really got started. Um, and, and which has sort of been a, a baseline for uh, a suite of apps, uh, themes, and an agency. Rehash, another agency that's a part of our portfolio. Um, who am I missing? And our, our recent uh, acquisition of archetype themes. So we've made a big investment in the themes landscape of Shopify. That's the We're backbone really of uh, of the of the store specifically for Shopify. So when yeah. you acquire one of these companies, you're saying that you're publicly traded. So all of a sudden they become publicly traded is what I'm guessing kind of happens. That's, yeah. that's quite a big deal. <laughs> It is. It's it's not easy. <laughs> There's a lot of different sort of mandates and requirements to do Paper that. Work. And so <laughs> yeah, as you might expect. Um, so we we sort of take that on. Um, we take on a lot of things that sort of a founder may not want to be spending their time on, um, be it like sort of HR or like building a sales and marketing team. We kind of consider ourselves like that partner that um, sort of fills in the blanks of where you may not want to be spending your time. Yeah. So uh, I, I like this a lot. So you've got a few of these companies kind of working, uh, I'll just use the word, in, in synergy of each other. Now they're under this bigger umbrella. How does that make them stronger together? And then also, what does that mean for merchants uh, now that we've got, uh, you know, basically Pixel Union, 460 and Stamped all under one roof? Like uh, me as a merchant, am I still buying from three different places? Does this just mean that the infrastructure behind them is better? Does it mean that there's a lower price? I, I like, how does it affect the merchant? Oh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, such good questions. Um, right now, the, it's a totally independent journey still. Um, we believe that it's important for each 
a company to maintain their own brand equity, um, allowing the founder to have their own journey. I mean, a, a lot of times founders will stay. Um, and we want them to stay. And so we don't want them to feel like they're giving up ownership of this thing that they have built. Um, so it's very much case by case and like how, um, how we choose to sort of synergize post acquisition. Um, I think that long term, there, there's a lot of benefits from a data perspective. It's really important for us to be investing in the data behind the scenes um, and allowing really the founders to be more um, sort of like empowered by understanding their customers and being able to benchmark across the industry um, and be able to sort of potentially leverage other opportunities in their sort of customer base based on what we're seeing across the board. How does that manifest itself? Does that mean building better features or in the right direction or launching new like yeah product line feature sets? Or is it more like, oh, well, I've, I see I've got your email list. You've got my email list. Let's just go, you know, email the crap out of these merchants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure I know. There's some rules around that as well. <laughs> yeah. We can't do that. Um, yeah. And also like, you know, we don't want one of our portfolio companies to lose customers as a result. Right. That's. It's just so sensitive. So it's more, um, yeah, it's more f feature opportunities. It's more um, customer acquisition opportunities, seeing openings and this sort of, you know, maybe this size of merchant is a great opportunity um, for this this company. So then maybe we'll, we'll see how it'll go with that company. I think more like that. Yeah. I got you. It sounds to me like, I mean, since the company is so new, but it's, you, you've got so much power behind it, like like power, just like money, resources, essentially, <laughs> uh, b behind you that I can I can see where you're heading with this. And I can see over the next three to five years, you're, you're, you're slow. You've got all the companies and they're little independent circles and they're just going to kind of slowly gravitate together till it's one <laughs> giant blob. And, and it, I think that it does become more powerful for merchants. And it, it, again, it makes, which we kind of alluded to in yesterday's opening keynote, um, all in one solutions are becoming more powerful. It's harder to, to just be a standalone product. And yeah. I think, um, you know, by the middle to end of the e-commerce journey, and I don't think it'll really ever end, but uh, you'll you'll be a conglomerate of solutions that make it uh, essentially all in one, even if they are under different brand names. Um, yeah. So I don't I don't know if it ever really fully merges under one name, but it's like um, makes a, a job kind of easy for me as a, as the person recommending technology to just go go with the WeCommerce commerce stack, and it's like <laughs> oh it's anybody that we commerce owns. Okay, great. Yeah. That's just one 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 decision, and then it's like you might have a competitor, and it'd be, it's like their stack versus your stack, right? It becomes a very large uh, fight between the two of you, as opposed to these tiny little fights at each layer. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. And I think as long as it's easier for the merchant, right? Like we're just trying to like put ourselves in the perspective of the merchant and how they're thinking about their experience. And if we can make that easier for them, we want to. And at the end of the day, like I think the merchant just wants best in class software in every vertical, right? Um, so it's it's a balance of, you know, providing that, but also providing them an ease of user experience. Yeah. And I think of best in class as what's best for me right now and c still will work for me as I grow and scale, you know, and, and some companies, you know, aren't going to grow and scale. Maybe it's just a hundred thousand dollar year business and then you just need the basic tools. But if yeah. you, you know, are launched, most e-commerce stores, especially those here today, want to grow. They want to go 100, 200, 500,000, a million. And, and we've seen extremely high growth companies. And it's actually really tough to nail down that tool stack that's going to work today and tomorrow. So that, that, that always becomes a, a challenge for merchants. Um, yeah. As yeah. you think about scalability, I want to ask you about AI. Uh, this is a buzzword that we heard a little bit about yesterday, but uh, you're acquiring tech companies. So what what do you think uh, when it comes to AI? Do, is, does it make the tech company stronger? Does it, is it benefiting the merchant like more than, I don't know, let's call something that's not AI, it's just like a basic, uh, you know, algorithm or, or something that, that we don't actually call AI. But wh how do you approach AI as a concept when you're like vetting technology companies? Yeah, I think like there's some period like three or four years ago where it felt like AI became, um, it wasn't an exception in the companies that were sort of in the investment space, but um, became like a rule of like everyone ha is implementing AI in some capacity and that's sort of a requirement to to be in the competitive sphere. And um, 
so I, I think that we uh, are welcome it, are very open to it. We don't see it um, as a clear differentiator, except okay. in s- some specific sectors, like in personalization and merchandising. I was thinking exactly yeah. personalization. Yeah. yeah, that's the one where it's like algorithm versus algorithm, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And better algo. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a bit of a race because, like, how much data can you collect? Um, as quickly as possible. And so that how many customers can you bring in? How much traffic can you bring in? Um, so I think that's a really in, an interesting race to watch right now. <laughs> that That is fascinating. So, all right, let's, let's go into uh, the tools a little bit. This is, you know, ob- obviously my, my, I can nerd out about this all day long, but you're thinking about it. Um, you know, we are, we hinted at the conglomerate of tools and tools mm-hmm. that need to scale with us as we grow. But um, maybe for, let's let's start um, on your perspective of how merchants should be evaluating software tools and and what's working, uh, you know, for for finding tools today. Yeah, I think that um, I love talking about this too. <laughs> I <laughs> well, I just think it's incredible how quickly um, new software is getting developed right now in the ecom landscape, and as a result, I think you should be evaluating play quarterly, uh, what your tech stack is. Yeah. And I know that's a lot and everyone's busy and they're doing a lot of other things. They're you're running your business. But um, at the end of the day, technology does run your business in many ways, or it can um, sort of, you know, you can, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but um, automate so many things uh, in your business these days. And so evaluating in each sector, I think is really, really important to do very regularly. And I think that that, I think it's helpful for each uh, company to have their own sort of competitive landscape of what's important to them and sort of benchmark here, here, the, you know, here are the technology things that really push the needle for us. Um, You know, inventory management is really critical. It will always be critical. We need to ensure we're using the best in class in that sector all the time. Um, I think that, you know, one way to keep abreast of this outside your own personal research and outside of, um, you know, working. Me? With your, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me. yeah I, I, think, I think, you know, those are two ways to go about it that are very important. But I, I also do think, you know, we might differ on this, that looking at the competitive landscape, it can sometimes. <laughs> Um, <laughs> provide some value. I, I obviously don't suggest anyone copy their competitors. You know, you should be innovative, own your brand, do your own thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think with the new technologies coming out there in regards to like live shopping, um, on site video engagement, um, there might be new things that you might not be considering. Um, so, you know, who knows? I, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um. I. I think, you know, the the what we don't want to do is yeah follow our competitors blindly. So I'm I'm with you on this in one sense of of uh, seeing what they're doing and then getting some ideas of what maybe I should be doing. Absolutely. The um. But what what I've seen because companies have actually like launched in these spaces other kind of micro sites that give you the stack of a of like a fashion nova or something like that and they're tr- mm-hmm. they're kind of when they do this they give you the stack they're kind of trying to say well if you're in fashion like then you should just copy fashion nova stack and it's like well that's that's not practical i'm mm-hmm. i'm doing a million they're doing 100 million or more or whatever you know well, like right. you're you're just two completely different brands but if you see what fashion nova is doing well today maybe it's a on site quiz or something like that then I think, uh, and you go, oh, we should probably have a quiz. And you could even literally steal the exact wording of a, of a you know, a competitor's quiz. Sure. And, and then, you know, steal, use, whatever we want to call it. But like, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not something completely proprietary. And we did this in the beauty space at BoxyCharm when we built our own quiz platform. It's kind of bulky, long story short, but we needed the, the data points. But um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm totally... Uh, with you on on how to approach it is study your competitors, but don't follow them blindly. Um, and and this just comes down to the fact that they are everybody's making like ninety plus percent of merchants are making pretty bad choices when it comes to technology. They're going with what's popular, 
yeah. aka what your competitors are doing. They're they're going with um, what solves like a uh, one problem today. Uh, they're, they're you know they're there's um, they're going with tools that might be siloed or just trying to patch little holes or the person that's choosing the technology product is not aware of the rest of the stack because they're just trying to solve one individual problem, not thinking about how it's going to impact the rest of the business. Uh, and then, the, uh, yeah, and, and the, the list goes on. But um, I know we've got a site here. I can bring it up um, for us in just a second that uh, you, uh, you, you kind of, in our pre-call, uh, counterpointed and said, no, no, no. If you study this company, like, you'll be better. Tell me about, um, it's called, what is it, Il Maquillage? Yeah, I just, I think the, the key is, like, that the consumer is really smart and, like, you should just be doing things that are unique. Um I, and I know that it's very scary and you should definitely be doing A-B testing and um, collecting a lot of data before you make a big decision like they have. But I, I really think that um, the consumer is so used to seeing the templated Shopify uh, site with like the typical True. plugins that anything that you can do outside of like your, you know, your branding and your design to stand out, I think is, uh, yeah, I think really, really special. And so I... I was shocked when I received an ad um, on Pinterest for this company for a foundation. And then I went to the site and it walked me through this entire video of um, how this influencer had done her makeup. And I thought, thank God, this is 10 times better than me going to Sephora and getting super overwhelmed in five minutes and leaving because I'm not quite sure. Like I look at the all the foundations, I don't know what I'm doing. Like this shows me exactly how she is implementing each of these products. Um, so I really yeah. appreciate this type of like- I, I think any, anytime we need to be taught how to use a product, we have this opportunity to do something similar. Um, this really is impressive because it's, it's doing such a great job at uh, bundling essentially so that you buy all the products together. And then it's even showing you how to use them, you know, before you buy, and uh, they're they're just breaking all the barriers. So we've and we've got the quiz. They even say that you can try before you buy by just paying for shipping. And then if you like it, you know, then you pay for it later, um, or you can return it. So there, it's like it's really tough to say no to uh, to something like this. So if I'm in the market for for beauty products, which I haven't been in the market for a while, let's face it. <laughs> but if, if I happen to be in the market for beauty products, um, then then like this is the way to shop. Um, yeah. This is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's almost like social selling. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on on selling on social media? Just throwing a, a random curveball at you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it's great. I think it's interesting that um, Shopify recently announced their partnership with TikTok on shopping. Yeah, I awesome. can't wait to hear how that goes. That's awesome. Um, I think it's good. I think it's you know a really important aspect of. Um, what's going on culturally in social right now is that people are spending so much of their time there. And so partnerships like that are uh, really key. I heard, um, who was it? Dylan Whitman, who's uh, been in the e-commerce space for a while. Um, he, he said he, he was very like bearish on, on social selling online on really? LinkedIn yesterday. Yeah. And, I, you know, he made some like arguments about how like it's still better to send people to the site and it's hard to bundle and upsell. And it's like what we just saw here is like the opposite. It seems like it's you think you're going to increase conversion rate and you can sell multiple products at the same time. You can shop the look, the whole thing. So. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, they're essentially copying what people are doing on YouTube um, or on Instagram Live. Like it's, you know, they're having to morph the e-com experience to fit the social experience. But like props to them for doing it, right? Like that's a huge risk um, and they're taking it and I, I think it'll pay off. And how do you think about this when it comes to technology that you might want to acquire? Are you guys looking in? I don't know what I should be asking here. Are you looking in the social <laughs> selling space? Uh, and, and you've got 460, which okay. kind of brings that experience to yeah. the site. Uh, have you talked with them about what they might do to enter that space? Or is like, is it a, is it a talking point in the in the team meetings of we need to get into this space? Or are you, you know, you've, I'm sure you, there's a lot of core technologies that you're looking at as well. Yeah, I think, I think cautiously, um, 
definitely and opportunistically. I, I love the space. It feels very new. So like a lot of the companies that I've talked to are raising venture. Um, and, you know, for the most part, we do majority investments. So it, it we're, we're kind of off limits from what I'm seeing. I also think like it's a little bit unclear how or when it will unfold globally, because I think there's a lot more sort of live shopping sort of stuff going on. I guess live shopping is very different from social commerce, but, um, you know, that really hasn't been adopted quite so much um, in the U.S. So I, I think we're like a few few years back on that. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely I definitely think it's something we're interested in, but it's not it's it's not, not as cool. Is yeah, that because yeah. it's. I, I do agree that it's not, it's a fringe technology it's, or not fringe. It's, um, it's not for everybody is the right way to say it. So it's not, it's not universal. Uh, what, what, so it's a, it's a niche technology. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. 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 I, I think we, we get interested in like sort of what applies to every merchant, what applies to every consumer um, first in, okay. in the priority shopping list. <laughs> I, I got you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're shopping. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to walk into the mall that you're going to, which is like <laughs> looking at email service providers, SMS providers. It's like this is a, a, a totally different kind of shopping yeah. scene. Um, but, uh, I, I absolutely uh, love it and appreciate it because it is it is what um, will be the backbone of, of changing this landscape. And uh, as you said, for, for the better of the merchant. Um, I want to change the topic for you because I know this is something that you've thought about and I want to talk about kind of like the future of of work and and where this is all going because we're talking about tools for merchants uh, some of them AI driven some of them are displacing jobs or replacing jobs we saw gorgeous yesterday with the customer service help desk that can kind of they displace about 33% of customer service um, em employees so they're they're really getting closer to you know it'll be 50% soon and then 70% and then you know you might have just one person managing the AI that manages all of customer service for you. So my prediction is that most of marketing operations, advertising and sales can be nearly fully automated in in less than 10 years. So uh, I just uh, you tell me if I'm close here and then if that's true what what are what are the jobs what are people going to be doing for work? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that I 100% agree. Um, and I love this topic because I was prior to this, I was at Bloomberg Beta where they invest exclusively in the future of work. So we talked about this a whole lot. Um, I think in this industry, there is not, it's not just like a contraction of jobs, but also an expansion. So I think it's sort of a displacement um, because yeah. I think that there are definitely tools, exact, you're exactly like in the customer support sphere that um, do cause some, yeah, some sort of contraction in the job front. Um, I think that Alloy is a really interesting example of automation and how they are automating the more operational tasks throughout the tech stack. Um, yeah. But I think also with this, there are new jobs that come with it. Uh, one example being the conversational SMS landscape. I mean, so many people are transitioning from sort of marketing focused SMS to conversational, which implements um, not only like marketing tactics, but also um, customer support tactics. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, there, there are more jobs, more people that are going to be needed to be in conversational commerce, uh, similar to, let's say, uh, retention tools out there. Talk to the founder of Wonderment and about how they are building what they would consider to be like a retention platform. And so uh, there, there is that's a whole different sort of sector of focus, whereas there's sort of paid marketing experts five years ago, there are now retention experts um, that are required in everyone's sort of marketing team, at, like as a merchant. So I don't, I think it's just interesting. I think there's just more, the, the, the focus is just shifting within sort of everyone's teams um, as, as a merchant, as technology sort of shift and some things get easier, uh, that that means there's other things to focus on. Yeah, we're moving from acquisition to retention. I demoed Wonderment recently and was really blown away by what they've built. 
Um, and, you know, I think their, their competitor, uh, they, they compete in some ways with Malomo, but they've yes. taken a different approach to it. And so, um, and, and both tools, I think, have like a really high growth potential. Um, and, and it's a very, it's becoming a, a competitive space. So, um, yeah, I, I think yeah. that this is, this is a whole nother conversation we could talk about um, just moving into retention and, and talking about um, um, let's just why we need to be focused on our existing customers instead of getting new ones. But, um, but let's stay on this, um, on, on this automation front a little bit more. I'll throw out a few more tools that are automating. Um, and I think we've got Pencil coming in later today, if I'm not mistaken. Pencil yeah. is, is displacing your content team. So if you've got a video production team and all that stuff, they're, they're taking a lot of work off of the plate of video production and making it easier to pump out a ton of different ads that can go straight mm -hmm. into your ad platforms, Facebook and Instagram, of course, and soon down the road, they'll be integrated with Snapchat, TikTok, and probably anybody else that'll take a video. Um, and, and then getting that AI-driven feedback and then AI-driven adjusting the video based on the feedback so that it increases the return on ad spend, which I think mm -hmm. is like really incredible. So like, us as marketers usually have to look at the two videos and then decide what worked from them and then go with, you know, adjust, you know, the one that worked better and adjust some things from there and see if we can keep tweaking and improving. This is actually doing it in a scary way where you don't really have to intervene. You really just approve is all you're doing is, is saying, yes, okay, test that. Yes, okay, test that. So that's a cool one that's that's um, displacing some jobs, I would say. Um, upsells and cross sells as well as merchandising. We talked about personalization uh, briefly, we hinted at it in the algorithms there. Um, in the past, you had to create your own upsell funnel. This was a big thing when uh, in the early days of e-commerce. You know, you had the you had the the tripwire, the core offer, and the profit maximizer. Right? Those are the three three things of your upsell funnel. And nowadays, um, especially with large SKU counts and for larger merchants, it's uh, it's about showing the products that are related or alternative, and letting the AI decide which one's going to sell. So that one changed the game. Merchandisers, like, they have less of a job to do. They, they just, like, choose, do they want to maximize revenue, profit, clear out inventory? Like, that. you just click a button. I'm not even kidding. I saw it in the back end, I think, of LimeSpot. It's like, which, which one do you want? How do you want to make money today? <laughs> it's, it's totally different. Um, any thoughts on that? I'm just rambling. <laughs> Uh -oh, oh, my connection's a little bit wonky. Okay, no worries. Uh, let, we'll move on to the next topic because this is one that is is um, is rising quickly, and we heard a little bit about the um, iOS 15 update that's going to eliminate um, it's it's going to eliminate email opens being a metric for us. But let's um, let's go back a little bit to Cookie Apocalypse and what zero party data is and what's What's the new, let's say, stack uh, for optimizing for collecting zero-party data? Yeah, I, I heard cookie apocalypse, so I feel yeah. like I, I <laughs> <laughs> understand that what we're talking about. Um, yeah, I think it is really an interesting time, but fortunately, I there are so many platforms out there that I feel like merchants probably are already utilizing to sort of benefit themselves through this process. Uh, and obviously like there's no replacement for like seeing high ROAS on paid advertising channels and that sort of just working uh, as it has for the past, you know, 10 years. But I think there, the focus on zero party data is a really important one just in general. And um, it's a defense mechanism sort of in the acquisition sort of sphere. So oh, I, like I was that. defense mechanism. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was just made that up, but yeah, it's um, it's it's a big requirement, and so I've um really been you know always fascinated by the these sort of opportunities to own your own data and collect really unique insights. I think that's the most interesting thing. Is like, you know you've got your customer data platform and you, you know, your customer's name, address, you know, maybe age, maybe uh, gender, but there's so much more interesting stuff you could be collecting on them. Um, you know, how they feel about travel, you know, what their hair color is totally de depends, but the platforms that I think about to 
have in your tech stack for zero party data are like having a mobile um, app builder. So, I mean, your conversion rates on an app are out of control compared to on a site. So, um, utilizing like Tapcart or Plowball or Shopney um, to have your own app is super critical. I think that we talked a little bit about quizzes earlier and Octane AI has been sort of a leader in that in that landscape. And they're putting out a lot of good content on how to um, strategize on your zero, your zero party data strategy. Um, so I think they're, they're fascinating. Again, you can be collecting information on your customer's hair color. Um, Enquire Labs is another platform we talked to recently that uh, is collecting data post-purchase, which I love. I, when I was a brand, I had a brand, I was a merchant, uh, you know, that was really important to us to get insight on how people heard from us, um, why, why they purchased, things like that. Let's see what else. Um, yeah, yeah. And obviously, like any sort of chat, you know, messenger chat, on-site chat. Um, I think the the implementation of like video chat in in Ooh. here is really interesting. Um, I, I something tells me you're going to be acquiring a mobile app builder in the future. <laughs> well, <laughs> not, to, not to spoil it, but yeah, I see that <laughs> and definitely. Um, and you know. Um, in just a second here, we're going to bring in the, the team from Certainly, and they've built an amazing live chat uh, conversation um, tool that that really um, does exactly what you're talking about. So it's it's um, quite powerful. We're, we're almost out of time here. Before we go, I, I just uh, we, we need to leave the merchants with one thing that they should be doing. What's what's that one thing that merchants maybe aren't doing today that they need to be thinking about um, in, in their business? Yeah. Uh, I know when we talked before, I listed like 25 things. The one, <laughs> thing, one thing, yeah. <laughs> the one thing is implementing a CDP and doing that as early as you yeah. can and setting up. A, I know that's really hard as a small merchant to like be invest. You're just go, go, go. But I think investing in data behind your customers and just you're just powered with so much more knowledge of what you should be doing. Otherwise, you're flying around blind. And so I think investing in that and being really thoughtful about segmentation um, is just the most important thing you can do. Yeah. Keep your database clean and structured from the beginning. Make sure that you've yeah. got things like Alloy working to, uh, you know, it can manipulate data and then put it in the right place as you yeah. grow. So if you find a spot where for some reason there's a data disconnect or uh, or there's uh, you don't know how this customer got to you. Like we said, use Inquire Labs, you can get a post-purchase survey or something like that. Like try and find those those problems that are gonna become, they're small problems today, but they become big cracks tomorrow mm -hmm. when you go, I don't know how half of my revenue got here. Like that's a, a big <laughs> problem because like if you know how it got there, then you know what to invest in. So the yeah. those unknowns are, are super important. One thing that came to mind for, for me when we were talking uh, about tools, I, I came up with a random idea as you were talking, which is maybe create a Slack channel that allows your team to communicate around problems that they see with tools that they're using today, problems that they see that they think could be automated or solved by a tool. And then just like let anybody just give feedback in this channel and like let the conversations flow. And that should naturally kind of have these emerging uh, like team meetings where you're like, well, like seven people saw that they were spending too much time in spreadsheets over here. Uh, you know, you go figure out if there's a way to automate this, right? Like go find a person that can do that. And in, in tech companies, you have this person, they're like called a growth marketer. And often their job is to like make these connections seamless so that you don't have to do a bunch of work, whether that means pulling in UTM data and turning that into, uh, you know, custom fields or whatever it, the case may be. Um, I think that there's there's a way to open up communication within the organization and help them uh, kind of naturally see problems bubbling to the surface a little early and thus not be constantly putting out giant fires. So my random thought there. At least I know I, I I've been talking a lot myself. I am really uh, I really enjoyed everything you said and and the conversation today. I love what you're doing uh, with WeCommerce. As always, if you ever need anything from me, I'm just an email away. Um, thank thanks so much for for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always fun to talk with you. I appreciate it. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna let you go, and we'll give a quick plug to WeCommerce in the chat here, just in case people want to follow along on the journey. Awesome.